In this video, we'll try finding the continuity of greatest integer function. It's a beautiful function, so let's plot it first. So the greatest integer function is y equals to fx equals to x, and you write x in this square bracket. So this is our greatest integer function. How does it work? Well, it gives you the greatest integer that's less than or equal to this value. So if you put an integer inside it, let's say you put in 10, you'll get the same value as the output. You'll get 10 as the output. But if you put in something that's not an integer, let's say you put in 9.9, .9, you'll get the integer that's just less than 9.9. .9. That's 9. So if you put in 15.1, you'll get 15. But if you put 14.9, you'll get 14. So using this definition, we can try plotting the graph. If you want to give this a shot, pause the video, try it on your own. Okay, let's do this together. Let's start with the integers. For all the integers, we get the same output. So for zero, we'll get zero. For one, we get one. For two, we get two and so on. So you're getting the same thing if you're putting an integer. All right. What about non-integers? What about everything in between? Let's say you put something between zero and one. What do you get? Well, for all values between zero and one, the output is zero because that's the next best integer. So you get zero, except at one, for which you get one. What happens between one and two? For all these values, you get the integer one. So there's a straight line between one and two. The value for all these points is one, except at two, where the value jumps to two. The same thing happens here. Between two and three, the output is two. Between three and four, the output is three between four and five, the output is four and so on. This works in this direction as well. Between minus one and zero, the output is minus one because that's the integer that's less than these values. Try putting minus half. The integer that's less than minus half is minus one. So this is what you get between minus one and zero. And then this goes in this direction. The domain here is R, all real numbers. For every input that you can think of that's real, you get an output. The range, however, is not R. The range is the set of all integers. So you only get integers as outputs. You get nothing else in between. So this is domain and range. What about the shape of this function? Well, to me, this looks like a ladder with a lot of steps, which is why probably this function is called the step function. Now let's talk about the continuity because that's what we're doing here in this video. At which points is this function continuous and at which points is the function not continuous? All right, so it's not continuous at all the integers. The value jumps at x equals to one. It also jumps at x equals to two. It stays the same and then jumps again at x equals to three. So looking at the graph, we can say that the function is a discontinuous at integers and it's continuous everywhere else. Any value that's not an integer is a safe value. You can move to its left and you can move to its right. You'll get the same output, but that's not the case for integers. But this is a visual way of explaining it. Let's do it algebraically as well. Let's make some space. Okay, let's make two cases. The first one, when you put in an input that's not an integer. The left hand limit at C, this is limit x tends to C minus f of x. This is equal to limit x tends to C plus f of x, which is the right hand limit. And both of them are equal to the greatest integer of C. Think about it. Put any number that's not an integer. Let's say we put in 1.5. Let's move slightly to the left of 1.5. What do you get? Maybe 1.4999 or 1.499999. What if you move to the right? You get 1.51111. No matter which point you pick, if that is not an integer, there is always a point to the left and to the right, which is also not an integer. This means that all three values will give you the same output. 1.5 gives you one, so does its left side and its right side. So all three values are same. This means for the input that's not an integer, the function is continuous. Now let's take case two, where we're putting input as an integer. So this time C belongs to I, which is the set of integers. So we're sitting on an integer here. Its left hand limit will be something less than that. So suppose we're sitting here at x equals to one, the output is one, the input is one. If we move left, even slightly, we jump off and we end up here. Now when our input is slightly less than one, our output is no longer one, it's zero. And if we move right, 
well moving right is safe we still end up with the output as 1. So whenever we are looking at integers, the left hand limit and right hand limit should not match. Let's see this. The left hand limit is x tends to c minus fx. This is going to be limit h tends to 0, a very small positive quantity. Greatest integer of c minus h because we are coming in from the left. So if c is an integer, something slightly less than that will give us 1 less than c. So that's going to be c minus 1. What about the right hand limit? Limit x tends to c plus fx. This is going to be limit h tends to 0, c plus h, greatest integer of it. So if you're moving to the right, we're safe, we'll still get c. So right hand limit is c, but left hand limit is c minus 1. Now the value at c is going to be c, but that's not important, the limits don't match. This means that the function is not continuous for all integers. All right, let's solve a problem. We have the function fx as x minus greatest integer function of x. We have to show that this function is discontinuous at all integral points. So the same thing, but here we have a different function. Pause the video, give this a try. Okay, let's do this together. The left hand limit at c, where c is an integer. Because we want to prove discontinuity at integer points, we'll take in c as an integer. So left hand limit is x tends to c minus fx. Right hand limit will be x tends to c plus fx and we'll also find the value at c which is f of c. Let's figure out these values. So left hand limit will be x tends to c minus x minus greatest integer function of x which is its definition. So if you plug in x as c minus h we get limit h tends to 0 c minus h minus greatest integer of c minus h. Because we're coming from the left we are having c minus h. Here h is a very small positive quantity. So it doesn't do anything here, but it changes things here inside the greatest integer sign. So we get c minus h, that's c minus this becomes one less than c, so that's c minus one. So we get c minus c minus one, c cancels out, minus minus plus, so we get one. So the limit from the left hand side is going to be one. Let's see what the limit from right hand side is. So that's limit x tends to c plus x minus greatest integer of x. That's going to be c plus h in both these places. So plus h is safe. We get c here and c plus h is also c. So c minus c is going to be 0. This means from the right hand side we are approaching 0. And let's see what the value of the function is. f of c that's going to be c minus greatest integer function of c. That's c. So c minus c is 0. This means the value at c is going to be 0. These things don't match. This means that the function is discontinuous at all integers. And by the way, this is called the fractional part of x. It's also a famous function, just like greatest integer function of x. And the graph looks something like this. We can check for all integers. At 1, on the left hand side, we are approaching 1. And on the right hand side, we are approaching 0. So the left hand limit is 1 and the right hand limit is 0 which is also the value at this integer 1. That's the case for all the integers. There are breaks throughout and all these breaks happen at integers.